Hi everyone, my name is Chris Ryan. I'm a data scientist at PingThings. Today I'm going to be talking to you about several different complementary components of the PingThings platform, and later on in the talk we'll focus on the BetterDB Python library, which is a way that users can interact with the data they have stored in our database and um, use that for Python-based data analysis uh, work inside of the Python data stack. As I mentioned, the Pink Things platform provides several different tools built on top of the Better DB database, which is a blazingly fast time series database. These tools are all complementary, and they allow analysts to quickly gain insights into their data in various types of bespoke as well as routine ways. Some examples include the Plotter visualization website, which is a very quick and rapid way to scan across large swaths of data at high resolution, at low resolution, zooming in and out. Um, for more um, custom analyses, we provide Jupyter Notebook servers um, to our users so that you can connect the database and write code in the Python data stack that is meaningful for your applications. In addition to these, we have different types of ETL tools and code that we have that will help ingest Parquet data, CSV data, other types of file formats into the BetterDB ecosystem, as well as um, Distill, which is a real-time data processing tool which allows um, for rapid types of analytic uh, streaming types of um, processing that can be done. The database stores each data set as a univariate time series, so a collection of times and values. These are called streams, and the basic way to organize streams is to organize them into groups called collections. Collections are analogous to directories in a file system. In the same way that directories can contain files, collections contain streams. We have an example of that on the right. So here there's a hypothetical utility called AMERPA, um, and AMERPA contains uh, the deployment contains a millions of different streams that correspond to um, different smart meters. Um, here we have a collection name called AMERPA slash meter 64301. So it's kind of analogous to there being like a directory that's a higher level called AMERPA and a subdirectory called meter 64301. This unique string is the collection name. Within that collection, is associated three different streams. One is a voltage stream, one is a current stream, and one is a power stream. So in this example, only there were uh, two levels, a higher level and a lower level, um, but collections can be arbitrarily deep. Um, there could be three folders, five folders, etc. cetera, um, represented as a string. The only condition is that this string is unique. In addition to the time and value pairs that constitute a stream, each stream has also contained four important pieces of metadata. The first of those is a unique identifier. So typically that would be a long random string that can be used to identify and retrieve um, the data uh, in the stream or reference it in some way. The second piece is the collection name. Again, in our example, that's amerpa slash meter underscore 64301. Each stream has also contained a name, so that would be in the examples at the right in the dotted line, V, I, and P, which are you could have written voltage, current, and power, for example. And finally, a unit of measure, so volts, amps, or watts, for example. Um, and that at a high level is what a stream is. Um, now that you've inserted the data into the database, though, you can query it. You can query for the raw values that you inserted, so you can retrieve all the data you inserted um, very rapidly, if you, that's what you're interested in, if that's what's important for your analytic calculation. Um, but you can also query for windows of data, um, which contain aggregate information, which we'll discuss in a moment. This is very fast because the statistical aggregates are computed during insert, um, as opposed to on demand, so they're ready for you um, to retrieve um, very rapidly. In addition to the four pieces of essential metadata, each stream can contain arbitrarily rich other types of metadata that can be important for characterizing the data set for the users. In particular, the user controls the annotations of, that a stream can have. These are the primary means for, for controlling metadata. We see on the right in the example that um, in the collection USGS Geomag Sen 1, 
for the um, the SJGH stream, there's many different types of useful metadata, like the digital sampling rate of the stream, um, the latitude and longitude of the sensor, as well as the source of the data, the station location, etc. Um, the tags, on the other hand, are mainly used by the system. We have the two essential bits um, from before, name and unit, as well as some information about the distiller as, and the ingress, um, which are a bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, data are versioned separately from the metadata that you're seeing here, but they're both separately, they're both versioned. So in other words, you can, when you update um, the annotations here, as well as when you update a stream, um, the version number increments, you have updated the data, but you can also go back in time to previous versions of the data, so nothing is lost. The data within a, within a stream can be retrieved as one of either two different types of points. The first and most fundamental point is the raw point. A stream can consist typically of many billions of raw point instances. The database was designed to handle this well and still operate at blazingly fast speeds. These objects contain a time property and a value property. Times in BetterDB are nanoseconds since the epoch, the epoch being January 1st, 1970, which is a very common way for um, times to be represented in computers. You can see an example raw point on the right. Um, typically, this is the output from a Python interface to the um, database. So this raw point has the nanosecond since the epoch, which is this very long number on the left, and its value is negative 200.009844. Um, if you want either of those two properties specifically, you can represent, uh, reference them as properties on the object by typing dot time or dot value. Data within a stream can also be retrieved as stat points. These objects contain aggregate information over the time window specified, and this is really where the power of database truly shines, because these aggregate um, statistics were computed on insert for the various windows that can be specified. So you can view um, on a stat point its time, its min, its mean, its max, its count, and its standard deviation within um, a window that can be arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small. Aggregate windowed queries are exception fast. Um, you don't have to read a billion data points to find the mean of a billion data points. As I mentioned, um, these, these means would be ready to go because they're pre-computed. You don't have to go down to the values and recompute them. Um, we'll look at that closer in just a bit. On the right, we see an example of that. So um, on the right, we see a stat point. The first property um, you see is the very long um, nanosecond timestamp followed by um, a series of comma-separated values. Um, and you can retrieve, just as before, these different properties by referencing them on the object. So dot time, dot count, dot min, dot mean, and dot standard div. So I've just covered how data in the database is represented as streams, and how the data within each stream is represented at different kinds of points. Um, BetterDB provides a Python API for rapidly interacting with these kinds of streams in various ways so that you can um, retrieve and update the data as needed. So specifically, you can query a range um, within a stream by specifying, for example, the UUID of that stream, a start time, an end time, and if, you're, if you want a particular version of your data, you can specify the version of your data as well. If you don't specify the version, you will get the most recent version, which is often the one you want anyway. Um, the database will return a version of the data as a number um, in addition to that. So that's something to be aware of. You can just discard that if you're not interested in it for your code, but you, will, you, can, you can have it and you can use it. You can, as I mentioned earlier, query statistical windows by specifying the same things as above. Um, the UUID start, end, and version, as well as the window size that you're interested in. So if you're interested in a, you know, one month's worth of data at a range of, um, you know, over aggregates for each day, you would specify that day as the window size that you want statistical aggregates for, um, and you'd get a, a list of stat points along with the version. 
The Python API also allows you to insert data into, an, into a stream. So if you want to write your own ETL code, you can. You would just specify the stream by specifying its UUID, its unique identifier, as well as all the data that you want to insert, and then you would call insert very simply from the Python API to insert the data. Similarly, you can delete data from a stream, um, always done to be done very carefully, of course, but you would do that by just specifying um, the identifier, the start and end time of the deletion that you want to make, um, and then that will be removed from the database. And uh, similarly, you can also compute diffs between different versions if you want to look at different versions of your data in that way. So Pink Things provides all these in, in a very simple way at scale um, at high speed via the Python uh, bindings. So that covers the general ideas about how data are stored and retrieved and updated within the database. Now I'd like to shift gears and talk a bit about the tooling that we provide as well as the analytic workflow that contains these tools. So the, pro the plotter is, the, is one of the primary tools we provide and it's the primary visualization website that allows human exploration of the data. So in other words, scrolling around as opposed to programmatically writing, for example, Python code in the Python data stack to look at data. Um, the plotter is uh, a website you can log into. It's actually a lot of the way that one explores the plotter, um, which we see an example on the right, is similar to Google Maps, where you can zoom in and out and then rapidly the resolution will increase um, as you zone in on regions of interest or zoom out, zoom out to large swaths that could be up to decades over time. In this manner, researchers can quickly hone in on trouble spots. For example, if there's a particular drop at a particular time and one can see, one can quickly zoom in, look for different types of patterns in the time series, and gather insights about what may, might be going on inside their sensors. Another important part of the Ping Things ecosystem are the Jupyter Hub deployments. Jupyter Notebooks um, are, uh, if you're not familiar, a way of writing Python code and combining it with plots and documentation to form a sort of top-to-bottom analysis that could be relevant and uh, for rapidly prototyping different types of work. Jupyter servers um, that we have will have for data locality and for individual notebooks for research. And when I say data locality, I mean that the code that you're writing and running will be located in the same instance as your BetterDB database. Each user can choose from multiple server options if they need more or less RAM, CPU, etc. So if you have um, a heavy machine learning workload or data processing workload and you know you need a very heavy machine to do that, um, you can choose those compute resources as needed for that day. Most of our user, users typically use these two tools in tandem for their analytic work. For example, they look into um, the, the data in the plotting tool on our website um, and they can quickly find the regions of interest. Then the, the tooling that are, that's on that website can actually export the, the data being shown at that time into Python code that can be, that can be copied and pasted into a notebook. Um, and that code can then retrieve the same data that was once in the plotter um, for further analysis inside the Python data stack. Um, then various analytic workloads can be computed, results stored and shared, and reporting composed. Now let's look at a simple example of how to use the Python BetterDB API in order to retrieve data in a Python notebook environment. So we see here at the top of the page, we've, we're importing some uh, Python libraries that are required for the notebook to run. Um, you'll see that the import betterdb um, command is there. That's because betterdb is a, it's just like any other Python library, you can pip install it just as you pip installed um, many other different types of, of libraries. Um, I'm also importing a couple of utilities I'd like to retrieve and you'll see a bit later. So first, I will get a BetterDB connection. Um, I know that I have my BetterDB API key and BetterDB endpoint stored in the environment. 
Um, so I can retrieve it like so in order to make a connection with the database, and it really is that simple. I can now run con.info um, to just verify that I have made a connection, and I'm connected to the endpoint that I um, expect to, that there are no issues, and this output tells me that I've done that. So next, I'm going to select and plot some data. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you can specify one stream completely by specifying its unique, uh, its collection name, as well as the stream name that lives in, uh, one of the stream names that live inside that collection, which there could be arbitrarily many. In this case, I'm going to be selecting the voltage stream. So um, these two pieces of information are basically a stream identifier. So you can, um, one way to get um, stream objects or ways that we can um, retrieve the data more simply is by using that identifier um, into this con.streams function. So again, this is our connection object. That connection object features a, a function called streams that if we pass in stream identifiers will now return stream objects. So when I say stream object, I mean that um, I now have a reference to that stream living inside this notebook. Um, and I can use the, um, the methods that live on that stream object in order to retrieve data and work with data associated with it. It contains basically kind of a, a copy of the connection to the database inside of it, as well as the information about the stream. So um, as you can see above, you can retrieve the methods um, on that, that stream object to get the stream name. You can do the same with the collection, of course. Um, and so now um, I am going to discuss um, the two different ways that I mentioned earlier about getting representations of a stream in, as data points. Um, the first, um, let me review that the way that we specify time windows. So BetterDB has this natural notion of um, what's called a point width. So it's basically the, um, the time window and the amount of time in that window is going to be um, two to the point widths nanoseconds. So in other words, um, a statistical window that has a point width of 46 That statistical window contains this many nanoseconds inside of it. Um, in order to make working with point widths easier, you can use this utility function that lives inside of the BetterDB Python library. Um, you would just pass in point width 46, and if you want to know how many hours that corresponds to, in a very simple way, you can go and get that. Now, why are we interested in um, what seems like an unusual way to specify a time window. Um, that is because BetterDB, um, part of the reason why it's so fast is the way that it organizes data in time. Um, and it organizes a, a, this as basically a binary tree. The details of, of this is a bit beyond the scope of this talk, um, but the documentation for this is great in the database um, uh, documentation as well as the Python library documentation. So I encourage you to go and look for that. Um, but I'm specifying a uh, window of time as about 19 and a half hours, um, which is a point with a 46, for example, because that's a very natural way in the database to, um, to specify a window of time. Um, and when I say natural, I mean that it's very fast for the database to retrieve data. You can specify any window of time that you want, um, and it will be a, it will still be blazingly fast. It'll just be a little bit slower than if you gave it basically the most natural form of time that the um, that the database would like to receive. Again, uh, this is a bit out of the scope of the the introduction right now, but it's a very interesting part of the technology, and I encourage you um, to. Uh, um, go to the documents uh, documentation and read a bit more, as well as ask lots of questions. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, you can grab um, that stream and then um, specify, let's say I wanted to retrieve data um, from 
July 2019 to July 2020 for that stream, which is basically one smart meter's data. Um, the, the database, um, as I mentioned earlier, works in nanosecond timestamps. So you could compute that out some way if you're interested. Um, or alternatively, you can much more easily use the BetterDB utilities for converting the, the date times that you're probably working used to working with in Python um, into nanosecond timestamps. So, you know, even though I've specified July 1st as I would in Python, what we have as a result from these utility functions are nanosecond timestamps that we can pass into the, the database functions. Okay, so let's see how long that takes to get for um, the raw values for that full year of, of um, that smart meters data. So that took, um, you know, about 350, 360 um, milliseconds, which is really, really fast. Um, but this is really just, that's the raw data that we've inserted. Um, and if that's important for your analysis, that's great. You can go and get that. Um, a lot of times that can be much longer than that short amount of time. Um, but just as a comparison, I'm working with something small to, to show you. So um, to compare how long it takes to, um, just to compare the, the retrieval times for raw values versus stat points, let's take a look at how long that would be um, to retrieve data from between that start and end, so over the course of that full year, and stat windows at about 19 and a half days, like I had shown earlier. So um, that's much faster. That's more than 10 times faster. If I had chosen a larger point width, which could be completely valid for an analysis that I want to do, it would be even faster than that. Um, but um, this is still basically data that is covering the same time span. Um, I've just computed um, and retrieved uh, many fewer data points because they're aggregated into windows of time. So let's take a closer look at that. So this is that list of stat points that I just mentioned. Um, and they look like the stat points that I showed earlier um, a few slides ago. We have nanosecond timestamps. We have um, all these aggregate data. Oops. And let's count how many those are. So that's about 449 um, stat windows, what you'd expect. Um, if you were looking at these 19 and a half hour time, time stamp, uh, stat window times. Um, so let's see. Above, I've just grabbed the first one of those stat points, um, just so we can look closer. And just as in the slide, if you type in dot mean, you'll get the mean for that particular stat point. You type in dot standard deviation, you get the standard deviation in that time window. These were not computed on the fly as I requested them. These were actually pre-computed on insert and they're just waiting for me to retrieve them because the database knows these are often useful for analysis. The full list of raw points by comparison is much larger. This covers the same span of time. Um, this is just the raw data instead of the statistical aggregates. Um, and there is over 60,000 of them. So let's take a look at a plot of the raw points. So this is the full year. Um, we can see that there was a minimum uh, about uh, in perhaps January um, that is really unusual. It's really much lower. It looks like it went straight down to zero. That looks like a trouble spot. Um, now let's say, um, we wanted to do this for millions of meters, we want to do this for higher densities, we want to do this in various different ways, this could start to get, um, especially for prototyping, if you're trying to look for the right way to look at something, it could get prohibitively expensive computationally. Um, meanwhile, let me look at what we can see with the um, statistical version, the statistical aggregate version of the same data stream. 
So I mentioned, you know, hypothetically we may be interested in these minima and how low they can go. Um, every stat window has a minimum. You retrieve that by typing in dot min. So um, in the much shorter version um, of stat points compared to the raw, raw points, we can make a plot of these mins. It actually looks quite a lot like the uh, the plot above. Um, note that uh, all of these values in the red line are just minima of each stat window. But if the minima are important, then that's that's what you can jump straight over to. And so note again that retrieving this was more than 10 times faster. And then for a larger stat window, if that's important, if that's also just as good, it would be even much faster than that. So that's how you get huge, huge 10x, 100x, more than 100x, much more than 100x speed ups and analytics queries using the database. So all that just covers just the basic set of topics related to how the platform accelerates analytics for various time series applications. There's so much more to discover and more to discuss, um, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions later about this, as well as any other topics that you'd like to raise by email, you can contact me at chris at pingthings.io. Thanks.